Hey, everybody. Welcome to the 118th episode of Fireside Chat on the Everyday Athlete Podcast Network that you can get not only through the RuntryMag.com website, but also on our YouTube channel, uh, on video, and then uh, via audio over on Spotify, Apple, iHeartRadio, Amazon Music, and YouTube Music. Today, we have a very special guest. Joining me today will be Eugene Day, who is an ultra runner and triathlete, as well as an engineer, scientist, pianist, cook, and baker. We're going to talk about sourdough bread, people, my favorite topic, who is training for his first 200 miler at the Go Beyond Racing Oregon 200, which will be taking place in exactly one month from today. So I'm excited to talk to Eugene about his process leading up to that race, including a tune-up race at Mount Hood most recently. So without further ado, let's bring Eugene on to the show. Hey, Eugene, how are you? I'm great. How are you, Jason? I am fantastic. We just chatted in the green room about a whole host of different things. And one of the first things I want to mention is that uh, a week from yesterday, so July 29th, Eugene will be turning 50 years old. So happy birthday to you. Thank you very much. I appreciate you saying so. Absolutely. By the way, Eugene and I also have a couple of other things in common, which is besides being ultra runners, we obviously love sourdough bread. Um, and uh, I used to live in Seattle and Eugene lives there. So um, let's just jump right into this. One of the things that we ask everybody as an icebreaker, Eugene, is pineapple on pizza, yay or nay? Absolutely not. Yes. <laughs> um, so th this actually goes to something. Um, my my college roommate and I used to say that like the ultimate example of um, of non-differentiable pizzas like like it, it, they're discontinuous is pineapple and pizza tastes like you're having pineapple and pizza at the same time and they're not mixing <laughs> versus pepperoni and pizza, pepperoni pizza where it's all one unified flavor of a pepperoni pizza right and um and so i love pineapple i love cheese pizza you put pineapple on a pizza and it's just you're just cramming two different foods in your mouth at the same time. It doesn't work. I love it. And that is by far the best answer I've heard as to why you should never do such a thing as put pineapple on pizza. Thank you so much for that in-depth response. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's just keep on the food train. I want to talk sourdough for anybody who is following Eugene or if you're not following Eugene, go to his Instagram account. Two of his last three posts are just loaves of sourdough bread. So let's talk about this. Is this a hobby that was launched because of the pandemic or have you been making sourdough bread as long as you can remember? So it, I would say it was relaunched in the pandemic. Um, I, I used to do a little bit of sourdough when I was a bit younger. Um, I was never very good at it. Um, I do everything sort of ad hoc, right? Um, I'm, you know, so like, you know, I used to try to keep a starter in the back of my fridge and I made a few loaves and they were sort of flat and dense and I kind of gave up on it. And then, um, and then when the pandemic rolled around, like every other person in America, I think the pandemic had the result of, it was as if the entire America took about 2 billion credit hours of home economics. Right. <laughs> um, and, uh, and so we did a couple of things to, to kind of produce food at home. I'm, I'm also someone who suffers from a lot of anxiety. And so, you know, at the very beginning of the pandemic, I was worried that like, you know, food supplies chains might break down, right? Like I wasn't worried about there not being enough food, but I was worried about their people's ability to distribute it in ways that would get it to everybody, right? Um, and so not that I was thinking that people were going to be starving, but that there may be disruptions to availability of items on a regular basis, right? So one of the other things we did, we started the sourdough starter and we got a couple of backyard chickens. Um, and I figured, you know, chickens are great because they turn garbage into protein. Um, yeah. And um, and so, you know, we we really started doing a lot of um, a lot of like home baking with the, you know, and with just two eggs, uh, two chickens. Um, you know, we were getting a dozen eggs a week. Um, and I love eggs, but I don't eat that many eggs. And so we had to figure out all these new ways to to use them and baking is a great way to use and preserve eggs, which are otherwise pretty hard to preserve. Right. Yep. Um, so yeah, so I would say, yeah, relaunched in the pandemic. Um, and, 
and we have been running it pretty consistently ever since. So you're training for the Oregon 200, which means you're out there running a boatload. Recovery yes. meals must come into play. What's your favorite way to use some of the sourdough bread that you're making when it comes to recovery or even pre-workout for that matter? So, um, I mean, the, the one of the great things about sourdough, of course, is that in order to um, to make sure that your your starter lasts, you have to feed it and cast off all the time, right? So you always have like this extra bucket in the fridge, which is full of very, very sour kind of glop. <laughs> um, that is, that is, a it's, you know, what's called a SCOBY, a symbiotic community of bacteria and yeast. Um, and it's, and we make our, our sourdough starter with whole wheat. So it's, you know, it's, it's whole wheat that's been percolating in there. Um, and I use that to make pancakes. I use it to make flatbread and pizza crusts. Um, I use it in, in cornbread and, um and quick breads and all kinds of things and you know it's it's really um it's very nutritious um you know fermented foods give you um all kinds of they they, they make certain vitamins much more bioavailable right um and i'm not i'm not like a big nutrition i'm neither a big nutrition geek nor a conspiratorial nutritionist right where okay. there's a lot of people like oh don't eat this because it's bad for you or do eat this because it's good for you but like it is well established settled science that fermented foods provide you with micronutrients that are not necessarily available in other ways like if you want vitamin b12 you either have to eat meat supplement or you can just eat pickled vegetables right yeah. um and pickled vegetables will have it that regular fresh vegetables don't um and so i do a lot of fermenting at home just because i like it i enjoy it it's i, I love fermented flavors and um, and the, the foods are really, really nutritious. So for all you plant-based athletes or vegan athletes who are concerned about vitamin B12, Eugene just gave you the secret to getting more of it in the I mean, It is a source. I don't think it's a, a super good source. Like don't stop supplementation. Just <laughs> right. eat eating pickles, right? Talk to your nutritionist, talk to your doctor, <laughs> but there are, but like well-made homemade kimchi has vitamin B12 in it. The homemade pickles have vitamin B12 in it. Yeah. Awesome. So you just recently finished uh, the Mount Hood 50. Congratulations. Uh, I presume that's a tune-up for Oregon 200, which, like I mentioned in the intro, is exactly one month from today and starting. Yes. Where are you mentally when it comes to getting ready for your first 200-mile race? That's a great question. Um, you know, I, I really think that ultra running fundamentally is a, is a mental sport. Um, there is a baseline level of fitness that you need to achieve and maintain, of course, no question, right? This is not something that, that, that you can get up off the couch and do if you're not a runner. Um, but I also, you, you, to run a 200 mile race. Now this will be my first 200. So I don't know for sure, but I have run a hundred. I've done an Ironman. I've done many 50 Ks and three or four 50 milers. I've done a hundred K. Um, I firmly believe if you can run a marathon and feel pretty good the next day, you can basically run any distance. Um, and so, um, you know, that's what I mean by it being a mental sport. Like once you've got your baseline physical fitness to where you need it to be, I really believe that, uh, beyond that, it's just about convincing your mind and, and figuring out how to fuel yourself. Right. Um, so and hydrate yourself so that um so that you can keep going so where am i mentally i i feel like i'm i just kind of have this attitude that um it's okay to be nervous it's okay to be scared um it's okay to not know how it's going to go or what's going to happen um and at the same time like i know about myself that i'm the kind of person who um you know my only athletic skill is the ability to be in a lot of pain for a long time. Um, I'm not, I can't juggle. I, I, I can't shoot a basketball. I can't throw a football straight. Um, I, you know, I can't feel the grounder, but I can keep going no matter how bad it hurts for a very long time. Um, and this will definitely challenge that. Right. But what comes down to it for me is, you know, mentally where's my head at? 
I know it's going to hurt. It's yeah. going to hurt for a long time. And okay. So I just get ready for it to hurt for a long time. Um, and hopefully it doesn't hurt as much as I'm afraid it will. And then I'll have a good day. Yeah. Like I did the original Cocodona and day one was horrendous as, as most people who were following it. Um, I've heard that about Cocodona. <laughs> yeah. The first day is horrendous. And to your point, like you just mentally have to be prepared long days. You're going to be moving constantly and everything else. For me, the hardest day was turned out to be the last 50 miles. Yeah. I, I got up from my three hour nap in the van and I looked at uh, my crew chief, Maria Simone, and I just said to her, I don't want to do this shit anymore. Like, I'm fucking tired. <laughs> yeah. This is ridiculous. And she was like, look, it, it sounds absurd, right, to say you've only got 50 miles to go. Um, just one foot in front of the other. You have plenty of time. Don't worry about it. You'll get there. And so to your point, right, I think that if you can run a marathon and feel good the next day, you can do longer distances. You just have to train the the muscle that lies six inches between your ears to understand that you're going to, you know, for me, it was essentially almost came out to 50 miles a day, right? 50 miles yeah. a day, 50 miles a day. And, and, that's, and that's what this one has to be, right? So Oregon, they give you 100 hours um to go 200 miles so you have to, to go basically 50 miles a day it's it's just over four days mm -hmm. have you um started to plot out nutrition hydration uh aid station type of things or are you still waiting to do that as you get closer to race day i i don't do any of that shit okay <laughs> <laughs> um so i am bringing i have my coach is going to come and be my crew chief um and so she is making me do a little bit of that um but and my wife is like she's professionally a high level project manager at this point um her background is she has a phd in biochemistry but she's um she's a, a project manager and um and so she is definitely doing some of that but like you know when you talk about super long distance ultra running, maybe it doesn't have to be, but for me, this is a team sport, right? Yeah. And and all I am is the piece of meat that's doing the whole distance. That's um, right. And other people are going to tell me the things that I have to, to know. And so, like, I remember when I did my hundred miler, I did, and it's actually coming up in uh, in two a, a week and a half now. Um, is that Hamster Endurance Runs up in Bellingham, Washington, um, which is one of the most amazing events in the world. If you if you are thinking about getting into ultra running, that would be a great place to do it um but it is i did a 32 hour race which was it's just loops around lake Patton, and each loop is 2.6 miles Oof. and um and has about 150 feet of gain um and it's on a non-technical gravel track and um you know and so i just went around the loop and i just went around the loop you have to do 39 times to get 100 miles um, and I did that in just under 30 hours. Um, but like, I remember times where, you know, uh, I'm at loop 34 or something like that. And I've been going for, for 22 hours or more, more. And, you know, my wife says, what do you want to eat? And I'm like, I don't know. I don't know. Nothing sounds good. I don't want anything. And she says, if I put food in your hand, will you eat it? And I'm like, yes, do that, whatever. And she got a, I think it was like an avocado and cheese quesadilla or whatever. And like it went down and it was fine. And I'm fortunate that I may not want to eat, but I don't get sick. Right. Okay. I've never like thrown up. I've never, I felt queasy a couple of times, but I've never had like real GI problems. Um, and, and so, you know, like, yeah, I kind of have an iron stomach. I just, you know, I, same race late in the middle of the night, like two or three o'clock in the morning, I was on passing the aid station and the, the race director says, Gene, what can I get you? And I, I just said, I, all I, I want hydrocarbons that I can turn into carbon dioxide, right? Like, that's it. I need fuel that I can set on fire. Um, and and that's, how I, that's how I do it. I love, what do I love? I can go a long way in potato chips and Coca-Cola. There you go. That is the, uh, that is the top of the menu for many ultra runners, potato mm -hmm. chips and Coca-Cola. Like, it's, yep. it's hard to go. Coca-Cola is a magic elixir that fuels impossible dreams um I, I i never understood life in motion until i started drinking coca-cola during races <laughs> <laughs> it's so true you mentioned impossible uh, and it made me think when i was at cocodona 
you said you normally don't have like a desire for anything specific. When I was at Cocodona going into Prescott, I had told my team, I'm like, I want impossible burgers and Klondike bars when I get to Prescott and eating those things. It was like the shot in the arm to get going, yeah. but it was also accompanied by a can of Coke to, yeah. to keep moving. I mean, it's unbelievable how well that stuff works for um, getting an ultra runner going. What made you decide that you wanted to do a 200? Was it one of those things where you were like, I've done an Ironman, I've done a hundred miler, it's next in, in progression? Or was it more of, I want to test myself whether you had done the other things or not? So this has a couple of different aspects to it. So part of me wants to just answer the way I, I heard Courtney DeWalter answer it once, right? When she was talking about going longer and longer and she, you know, she did her first marathon and, and she said, well, that didn't kill me. What's next? <laughs> right. Um, and, and that is a lot like kind of that, like she, she put into words something that had been sort of nebulous in my head about that. And that's kind of it, right. Is, is, um, I want to take on the 200 miler for a couple of reasons. One, I want to take this 200 miler on for a couple of very specific reasons. First of all, go beyond racing is amazing. Um, and, and I could talk all day about the races that I've done with them, but if you're a West coast runner, um, and you want like a small, incredibly well-run racing company that puts on fabulous, fabulous events, um, takes it seriously, but has fun doing it. Um, and, and does what they need. Like I have, I have been with them both on the volunteering side of things and on the running side of things a number of times now. And, and I cannot say enough good things about this company. They are staggeringly good at this job. Um, and so, um, so I wanted to do theirs when they took on the, the 200 distance. And this is the second year of this event. Um, I wanted to do a trail 200 miler because I'm, a, I'm, I'm afraid of the dark. I'm just terrified of the dark. And that's something that I want to explore, right? Like, um, you know, I, I don't like to let my fears control my behavior. Um, and so I just figure this is going to be big and scary. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm afraid of animals out there. I'm afraid of getting lost out there. I'm afraid of forest fires. Like that's a big one that I'm scared of right now. Um, and so I'm just going to go out and I'm going to, I'm going to, you know, trust my crew and the race director to keep me safe. Um, and I'm going to trust my body to keep going and, uh, and I'm going to trust my bear spray if I need it. <laughs> and, and that's, that's where I'm going to go. Um, so, and then, um, and then, yeah, I think I really wanted to, to, I've done a hundred miles. I've done this. I've watched my wife do a trail hundred miler. Um, she did the Oregon Cascades, um, with another great organization. Um, I think it's their, um, Aspire running maybe Alpine. I wish I could remember. Um, but anyway, uh, and, and I, I just want that. I want to, I want to see what I can do. Right. It's a big shout out to uh, Renee and Todd over at go beyond racing. We've had them on our show before. Ohm, who is one of our co-owners, did the Oregon 200 last year himself. And, uh, you know, we can't sing the praises of them any more than than we could possibly have oxygen in our lungs because they yeah. do put on a good race. And um, they're very they're an inclusion based company as well. Mm -hmm. um, and uh, Trail Mix is also part of who they are and what they do. And so it's it's just awesome. Um that they're doing what they do to, to get more and more people involved in the sport. And I will say this for you, man, like I appreciate the fact that you're looking at your fear and instead of running away from it, you're running towards it. Um, that's really commendable. And, and I don't know how often people will look at a fear and say, I'm going to go do something as big as an, as a 200 mile race to tackle that fear, right? You could do a 50 mile race that might start at night and, and deal with it from that perspective, but you're choosing to do an event that, is essentially four days and, and four hours long um, to, to tackle the 200 miler. Um, yeah. When when you're out there and, and um, I'm wondering, what are your tips, tricks for yourself that are, you're going to be using to keep you moving? Again, you've done an Ironman, you've raced 50 milers, you've raced all sorts of different distances, you've, you know, 
you've got uh, you've got to have a bag of tricks. What do you think you're going to be using when you're out there? Um, bag of tricks. I you know maybe maybe I do. Um, I I guess I just have this kind of sensation that like once I start, I want to get to the to where I'm done, right? Um, I definitely, so I feel like there are sort of four food groups to the ultra runner, um, food, water, salt, music. Um, okay. and, um, and so, you know, like, that's what I tell myself is like, I am not allowed to quit unless I have tried all four of those things over the course of a decent amount of time. Right. Um, and, uh, because, because any lacking any one of those, I think, um, and music is really more of like a performance enhancing drug for me, okay. um, rather than, rather than a sustaining drug, um, the way, the way food, water and salt are. Um, <laughs> but, um, you know, if you're low on calories, if you're low on salt, if you're low on liquids, um, you can feel like, like you just start making bad decisions. Right. And so the, I need to make sure that, you know, if I'm going to, and I believe failure is an option, right? I'm not one of these people who's just like, I'm going to go and I'm never going to quit. And I'm never going to like, right. Like, I think that that makes the mindset brittle, um, rather than resilient. Um, so I think that, you know, I just need to get myself into the situation where, where if I really do come up against something that I can't do and that I need to drop or for whatever reason, if I'm injured, um, if I'm, you know, uh, whatever it is, um, that I'm doing so making a good decision, not a bad one. Right. And so, so there's, yeah, there's the food, water, salt, music. Um, and then I do have a lot of mantras that I go through as I, as I run. Um, I kind of start with like, you know, the first sort of, I didn't need to do any of this for the whole 50 miler that I was in really um, 10 days ago. Um, but generally speaking, like after I've been running for about 20 miles, I start to have to go, there is no pain, right? Like there is no pain. There is no pain. Um, and then after a while that kind of stops working. Um, and so then I kind of shift into pain is not real. Um, and, and what that means is yes, I'm hurting, but, it's not real. I'm not injured, right? I'm just tired and sore. Um, pain is not real. Like if this, this is not pain that is informing me of damage to my body, right? This is pain that is telling me I'm tired and I want to quit. Um, and then eventually that will stop working. And I just start saying, I love the pain. <laughs> um, and, um, and then every once in a while that will stop working. And I have to say, I am the pain, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> And, uh, and so, you know, I have that, I, that keeps going. I remember like the whole, the whole marathon of my Ironman, I just kept saying, this is fine. This is fine. Everything is fine. That's Courtney DeWalter again. Right. Yep. Um, this is fine. Everything is fine. You're fine. Keep going. You're fine. Um, and, uh, and so I, yeah, I have, I have those things that, that are just kind of in my bag as I go. And then like music really helps, right? I listen to cheesy music. I will sing out loud, um, listening to headphones as I run on the trails. Um, like I will cry listening to music as I run on the trails. Um, and, uh, and I, and I really like that. Man, I love it. Like I, I don't listen to music as anybody who has followed our account knows I have a total of two songs on my phone. Mm -hmm. Yet somehow I have hooks of songs from the 80s and 90s in my head, which is probably when I was listening to music more often and can belt those out. And singing at the top of your lungs while you're going through these things is like a magical elixir like Coke as well. Mm -hmm. I wanted to ask you, when did you start um, participating in endurance sports? At what age? Um. I ran my first half marathon. Uh, I think I was 39. Okay. So go back to Eugene at age 38 okay. <laughs> and, and this idea of doing these things and pain is not real and your legs are, will be fine. Like, could you imagine thinking that, you know, t what amounts to 12 years ago at this point? No. Um, so I started running at all. Um, when I was about 35, I had gotten divorced and, um, and I knew I wanted to date again. And so I thought, well, oh, let's see if I can get into a little bit better shape. Right. 
Um, and so that's how I started running and oh, I was in terrible shape. Um, I, and you know, so I just started like, maybe one day I'll be able to run a mile, you know? Um, and I started like walk jogging and I didn't realize it. I was kind of embarrassed at the time that like, oh, I can only jog for three blocks and then I have to walk for a block and then I can jog for three blocks and walk for a block. And now I realize that I was doing interval training, right? <laughs> um, <laughs> and, um, you know, so, so I started that. And then um, after I met my wife and, and she's kind of always been into fitness at least a little bit throughout her life. Um, and, uh, and we started running together. Um, and we had a bunch of friends that, that were runners that were you know more accomplished than I was, in, including a couple of Australian friends who had done, you know, I mean, triathlon is like the national sport in Correct. Australia um, and had done a bunch of triathlons. And so um, uh, it was my idea. I was like, well, hey, why don't we all get together? Like a bunch of us live on the eastern seaboard. Why don't we all meet in Pittsburgh and do the half marathon? Um, and so that's what we did. We went to Pittsburgh. We did the half marathon. And at the end of the race, I was like, all right, did that. Checked it off the bucket list. I'm done now. Um, and two weeks later, I was talking to my wife and I was like, we should sign up for another race. And I've just kind of been hooked ever since. This is why I love having these conversations. And it's one of the things that um, when I started this business, I didn't realize the, the enjoyment I would get out of conversations like this and the connections. So first of all, you and I in the green room, we talked about a lot of commonalities, right? So we talked about living in Seattle. We talked about obviously being ultra runners and Ironman finishers. We talked about being 50 years old. You turned uh, 50 on the 29th of July, and I turned 50 last December. We talked about sobriety, and now you mentioned being divorced, and I've been divorced myself too. And then going back to a week ago today, we talked to Rebecca Keat, who is Australian and is a triathlete mm -hmm. and, a, and a world champion at that nonetheless. And so you talk about, you know, that being the triathlon being the national sport. It's just so funny how some of these things come full circle mm -hmm. back to everything. Um, I do want to dive into this a little bit with, with the idea of sobriety. Um, okay. a lot of, we have a lot of ultra runners and, and endurance athletes in general that we talk to and, and sobriety is, is a topic that comes up a lot. Um, and oftentimes people will say that they've swapped one addiction for another, basically, right? I quit drinking and now I go run for hours on end. Um, for you, um, one, how long have you been sober and, and how do you think it's played a role in you being an athlete to be able to tackle the Ironman distance and then the hundred mile distance and soon the 200 mile distance? Um, okay. So I, how long have I been sober? I've been sober for just about 16 and a half years. Um, so February 16th, 2008, um, which means that literally just a few days ago, I passed 6,000 days sober. Um. And, um, you know, did I swap one addiction for another? I don't like personally, I don't like using the term addiction for things like running for things that aren't chemical addictions. Um, mm -hmm. I think that they are fundamentally different in important ways that said, if, if somebody else connects that way, like I don't, it, I'm not telling other people they shouldn't use it. Um, for me, like, that's not how I think about it. The, the way that I respond to running is utterly and fundamentally dissimilar to the way that I respond to alcohol. Um, you know, if I can't run for a while, am I sad? Sure. Absolutely. I don't like it. Um, you know, but I, there's no, I have no problem taking a few days off from running. Right. I did not like to take a few days off from drinking, you know, <laughs> um, <laughs> it, that's not the same thing. Um, right. and, and, you know, so, um, so I don't think that they are similar. Now, what is similar is something that's core about me. And that is that I am the kind of person who does not fundamentally understand moderation. Um, I am not good at moderation. Um, in order to have a lifestyle that functions, um, I have to put a lot of daily effort in. I have to build routines in. Um, and I am, you know, I am not good at moderating anything. Um, I, I will sit down and eat, you know, an entire deep dish pizza, even if I'm not particularly hungry, unless I like pay attention and, and say like, hey, I'm not going to do that. Um, 
you know, I, I got a PhD and I got a PhD without really a plan or knowing why I was going to get a PhD other than, you know, hey, my mom had one and, and my uncle had one and people tell me I'm good at math, so I should probably go do a PhD, right? Like, <laughs> you know, um, and I don't regret that or anything, but, um, but it, it tells you kind of where my mindset is, right? Like I, I go all the way in everything and I have since long before I was ever a drinker. Um, and so, you know, for that, running is kind of the same way for me, right? I go all the way. Um, and I haven't found where all the way is yet with running. Um, but what I know is that when I run a lot, my life gets better, not worse. Um, and whereas when I drank a lot, my life got worse, not better. Um, so I'm, I just don't think of it as an addiction. Um, you know, it doesn't have the qualities of an addiction that make my life unmanageable. Um, my life is more manageable when I run rather than less. And I am good at my job when I run. I am good at my relationship when I run. I am good at my diet when I run. It makes me feel better about myself. Um, and drinking was the opposite of all of those things. So I just it, I just don't connect with it being an addiction. And I, I appreciate your answer and, and throughout this entire conversation, Eugene, about N equals one, like the, the, the tips and the ideas and the mantras and, and the things that you're discussing are about you. And, Absolutely. And, and, and I think oftentimes when people read posts on social media, right, there's no context to them. And, and so people assume it must be everybody who does these things and, all, and that kind of stuff. But the way you talk about it in the form of N equals one, I really appreciate it because I think it's important that people understand that this is what I'm doing for me and it's what helps me. And it, if I do something else and it hurts me, you know, it hurts me, it doesn't hurt um, everybody the same way. And I think that's really cool the way you're able to um, explain whether it's, you know, racing a hundred mile, 200 mile, whether it's um, nutrition, whether it's moderation, it's, it's an N equals one. And I really appreciate that about you. Thank you for that. No, I, no, I appreciate you saying so. Thank you. I mean, you know, what, what I like to say is like, take what's good and leave what's bad, right? Anybody listening, if you connect with something I'm saying, that makes me very happy. Um, if you don't, that's okay with me. It doesn't hurt me if you think that I'm completely wrong. It doesn't hurt me if if you think that, hey, that works for him, but it ain't gonna work for me, right? Like, fantastic. Um, I'm me, this is what works for me. I think that some of the things I do are likely to work for a lot of other people, but if they don't, then they don't. That's no skin off my teeth. Yeah, there's no uh, one one size fits all, as as yeah. we like to say. So I have a, a another question for you. How did you get from triathlon and Ironman into ultra running? Because I know how my transition took place, but I'd like to hear how your transition from Ironman triathlon to ultra running took place. Um, I mean, there kind of was no transition. I started them both kind of in parallel. Um, so I. What, so my first, like, sort of what I thought of as like a crown jewel of athletic achievement was going to be a full marathon, right? And um, so I went and I did the, the Marine Corps Marathon in 2015, um, finished that, and I was like, all right, I've done a marathon. That's the biggest thing I can imagine, right? And so um, then, you know, I, I decided I wanted to try a triathlon because, um, you know, I'm just kind of privileged when it comes to swimming. My parents taught me to swim before they taught me to walk. Um, and so I literally like, I can't learn, I can't remember learning to swim. I was just always, it's just always something I've been able to do. And I'm not fast or anything, but like, I'm very comfortable in the water. Um, and so I was like, well, I, I can swim, I can ride a bike and I can run. So why don't I try a triathlon? So I did a, um, I did an Olympic triathlon and I had a lot of fun. And so then I, I signed up for a half Ironman and that was the first time I got a coach and figured all this stuff out. Um, and I did the Atlantic city half Ironman and I had a lot of fun. Um, but it wasn't something I could do with my wife because she doesn't like to swim. And so I just kind of like let that go a little bit at that point. And I was like, Oh, maybe one day I'll come back to this. Maybe I won't. Um, then we moved out to Seattle. We did another couple of marathons. We, we, you know, did a bunch of half marathons. I love the half marathon. Half marathon is such a great distance to it's run. A great you go, distance. you run for a couple of hours, you have pancakes, you take a nap, and you had a good day. Um, <laughs> and um, and so uh, then we moved out to Seattle and got into the trail running 
um, scene. And I, um, I got into ultra running because I started watching the ginger runner, um, YouTube channel. Um, and I have since met Ethan and I am privileged now to kind of call him a friend. It's not like, you know, we're not like super duper close, but like, you know, we, we know each other. We say hi to each other. We chat on Instagram. Um, and I've run his races, his race, um, every year since it's started. Um, Ethan Newberry and Kim Tashima Newberry. Um, they are fantastic people too. And talk about a great race. If you want to come run Tiger Claw, wow, will that kick your ass, but it is such a great race. Um, and I, I started watching his movies and I've just kind of always had this attitude of like, why not me? Right. Why, why should I be someone who watches this stuff instead of someone who does this stuff? Um, and so I just started going longer and we did our first, um, 50 K in 2019. Um, and, and then we just kind of started doing that for a while. And then I was like, Oh, I want to go back and do an Ironman. Um, and so then I went back and I, I, I did it. I was signed up for an Ironman in 2020. Didn't happen. Um, pushed it to 2021. Didn't happen. Pushed it to 2022. Um, and finally got my Ironman in, in late 2022. Which event did you do? Uh, Ironman California, which is in Sacramento. Yeah. Uh, we, we've got a couple of enjoying the journeys that we're doing for people who will be doing it later on in the year. Um, and yeah. we'll probably end up traveling to Sacramento to, to get some footage of them racing. So I'm not going to taint the jury pool. So I want to hear your answer. Harder, 100 mile race or Ironman distance triathlon? Um, I mean, there's, there's, I don't think that there's any question. A hundred miles is much, much harder than an Ironman. Um, the, I, I feel like, so here's how I break it down in my head. And maybe it's because the Ironman in Sacramento is a little bit flat. Um, but to me, an Ironman is a long day, not a hard day. Um, a mountain ultra marathon is a hard day, um, and a long day. Um, and so I think once you get to about 50 miles, um, especially if you're, if you, if you have some vert and some technical ground to cover, um, the ultra marathon is harder than the Ironman. Yeah. I've, I've done eight of each. So I've, yeah. I've raced at different locations all across this country and I would not disagree one iota with you running a hundred miles is much harder than, uh, racing an Ironman distance triathlon. Yeah. Me, I would, be, I would, I would love to hear from someone who has done both and says that the Ironman is harder than the, than the ultra marathon than, yeah. than the, than the hundred miles. I, I mean, I think for me, right. So if you're going 20 hours to 30 hours, right. Just not even doing anything, sitting at home, going to work, right. That's a long ass day. You got to worry about yeah. food. You got to worry about rest. You got to do all these things now throw in running <laughs> for that time frame, And then like you said, if it's a mountain ultra climbing, whatever it might be, 10,000 feet, 12,000 feet, you know, maybe more. I mean, it is a very hard day out there. So I, I, I didn't want to taint the jury pool, but I'm in full agreement with you yeah. on that. And, and I mean, and I am by no means um, diminishing the incredible effort it takes to do an Ironman. Right. But like I spent, I spent, eight months training for my Ironman, you know, doing my hundred mile bike ride and a five mile run right after it, everything. Mm -hmm. I, I was so fit and so prepared and I worked so hard and I just had a good day, right? Was it hard? Yeah, it was hard. Um, and, and I, again, wasn't fast. I finished my Ironman was 14 hours and 46 minutes. Um, but, but I was never, I was never unhappy during the day. Right. It was like, and, and for me, I, like, I will say, I, I don't think I have ever had a bad race day, even on days that were incredibly hard. And probably the hardest day I've ever had out there was the Gorge Waterfalls 100K, um, which, um, so 62 miles, 11,000 feet of gain, very technical footwork. And it was 34 degrees and pouring rain and hail all day. And I was out there for 17 hours. Um, and and it was unbelievably hard um and i had a great day <laughs> i had a great day um and i was you know, like and i would have missed the cutoffs if my wife hadn't been able to pace me for the last half marathon because 
I was, it was so slow and so hard. Um, and, um, and I had a great day and I had a great day because I went into it knowing it was going to be so hard. And that's for me, the key suffering happens when my experience diverges from my expectation. Yeah. Right. And so if I expect something to be the hardest thing I've ever done, and it's the hardest thing I've ever done, I'm going to have a great day doing it. I love it. Um, so I just asked you which was harder. So now I'm going to have you make another hard decision. You have uh, a choice to do one of the three following things. Which one are you going to do? You get to play the piano all day. You have to bake and you know enjoy eating your sourdough bread. Or you get to go out on a half marathon run, which you said you love the distance. Uh, I mean, of, of those three, if I'm going to, if I'm going to do it, I'll probably take the run. Um, playing the piano all day is, is definitely a high quality, especially like right now with my finger injury and I can't do it quite as well. Um, you know, I really, I'm, I miss that a lot. If you, if you go back in my Instagram feed and look at my reels, you'll see a lot of, fee, uh, you know, things of me improvising at the piano. Um, and, uh, and I, I truly love it. I go a little crazy when I can't play piano. Um, but, um, uh, yeah, probably the half marathon. I, it's just such a great day. Going out there. <laughs> Eugene, thank you so much for joining us. We're going to get ready to jump into our, uh, rapid fire discussion questions. But we, before we get into that, I do want to wish you the best of luck one month from today. Eugene's going to be taking on the Oregon 200, um, going 200 miles within a hundred hours with, um, plenty of climbing and plenty of dirt naps I'm presuming out there. So we're going to wish you the best of luck. We'll be cheering you on. Um, and we actually have somebody who's watching us going by the, uh, moniker of Kobos five zero three. Um, we'll be cheering uh, you on as well as you tackle the Oregon 200. Thank you so much. You know, I, I feel like, um, you know, it's going to be the hardest thing I've ever done. Probably um, failure is an option. Um, but, you know, I I have always said too, like in this ultra running career, what I'm looking for is failure. Right. I want to find the thing that. I think we lost his audio. Did we lose your audio? Uh, device unexpectedly stopped. Restarted. You hear? Yep, we got you okay. now. Yep. Sorry about that. I was just yep. I was just saying, like, you know, I I, I want to find the thing where I'm fit, I'm prepared, I have a good day, and I still can't do it. And and that tells me where my limit is. And um, you know, maybe this will be it. Maybe it won't. Um, I hope not. Um, and maybe I'll have to do something harder. I'll, maybe I'll come after Cocodona next. Who knows? Um, that doesn't feel like my race. And, and man, am I impressed that you've done it. Um, but, uh, but we'll see what's next. I really love the attitude, man. Like, let's just go, you know, take risks and bet on ourselves and figure out where, uh, where the envelope can get to on the edge of the table. So are you a fan of Oreos? Yeah. Are, do you like OG Oreos, the original uh, style, double stuff, the this cracker they call an Oreo Thin, or this uh, Ding Dong that they're referring to as Oreo Cakesters? Uh, so I will say my favorite is the Golden Double Stuff. Um, after that, the classic Double Stuff, and in a pinch, a regular Oreo. <laughs> in a pinch, I love it. <laughs> Are you a fan of licorice? Yes. Red or black? Black. Oh, so you like that uh, anise flavor? You're you're all in on it. Absolutely, absolutely. I'm 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 big on astringent, difficult flavors. Yep. <laughs> peeps, are you a fan of Peeps? Uh, I don't think I've had one in thirty years. Um, they're I guess they're not bad as marshmallow goes. I do have a a, a sweet tooth, but uh, they wouldn't be my go-to. Uh, you, we, you mentioned marshmallow. I wasn't going to ask about this, but you, you, you tickled my brain. S'mores. When you're when you're going out for when you're making a s'mores, are you going to burn the living daylights out of that marshmallow, or you just want it like golden brown on the edges? Oh no, I'm going to light it on fire. <laughs> yes. 
<laughs> exactly. I want that thing to look like a torch just in case yeah, I can absolutely. go somewhere. Absolutely. Yeah. Candy corn. Is candy corn a real candy or is it just earwax covered in sugar? The candy corn is delicious and it's magnificent. And, uh, you know, if my wife could hear me right now, she would be throwing bladed objects at me. Um, <laughs> but uh, I actually buy candy corn simply because it's like the one candy that I can have to myself because I know she won't eat it. <laughs> <laughs> You're the reason Brox is still in business then. Absolutely, I am. Yes, I love candy corn. Creamy or crunchy, peanut butter or nut butter, depending on your allergies. Crunchy every time. How do you prepare a peanut butter and jelly sandwich? Do you go peanut butter on one side, jelly on the other, smash them together? Or do you go peanut butter and jelly on the same slice of bread and then put the uh, other slice over the top? So I would do peanut butter and jelly on separate pieces of bread and then put them together. However, the correct answer is peanut butter and honey, and you oh. mix the honey to into the peanut butter on the bread. Fantastic. So now you've got your peanut butter and jelly sandwich on the plate in front of you. How do you cut it if you cut it at all? Do you go two rectangles, I two triangles, no cutting at all? The whole thing's going down in three bites. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Red velvet cake. Is red velvet a real flavor or is it just chocolate cake dressed up to go to the prom? It's just chocolate cake dressed up to go to the prom. Um, 100%. That said, it's beautiful, um, but I'm a carrot cake guy. Yes, my guy. So are you a raisin in your carrot cake kind of guy? I like raisins okay. Uh, you can put raisins in anything. Oatmeal raisin is better than a chocolate chip cookie and I will yes! die on that hill. Dude, we have way more in common than anybody <laughs> would have ever have guessed. Are you to back to carrot cake for a minute? Cause this is also another uh, contentious topic when it comes to carrot cake, uh, walnuts in the carrot cake or no walnuts. Of course you put walnuts in a carrot cake. <laughs> and then the last one, cause this happens, I've seen it. It's very rare, but it does happen. Uh, pineapple chunks. I know they're no good on pizza, but what about pineapple chunks in the carrot no. cake? So a carrot cake with pineapple chunks should properly be called a hummingbird cake. Um, and it should be properly thrown into the trash. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, right along with the pizza, right next exactly. to it. What's your favorite flavor of ice cream? Um, I'm not sure I have one specific flavor. It's it's really what you know. I look at what's on offer and I and I go with it. But um, I definitely like peanut butter ice cream. Um, and uh, I love I, I like plain old vanilla ice cream. Um, and I like um, pralines. I have to ask you this because I had not heard of this until last week. Strong Doc ATL Nelly said that she likes peanut butter ice cream, but actual peanut butter ice cream, not peanut butter swirls. So are you actual peanut butter ice cream? Either or way. Butter? Either way. Yeah. I mean, you put if you put peanut butter on an asphalt shingle, I will eat it. <laughs> candy bar. What's your favorite candy bar? Uh, probably Snickers peanut butter. <laughs> yeah, that's a dumb question. <laughs> Pumpkin spice or apple cider when fall hits? Uh, apple cider. Savory or sweet is the only option you have for the rest of your life. What kind of food are you going to be eating? I mean, if it's my only option, I'm going to be going savory simply because I get sick of sweet after a while. Yeah. Um, but I would be a sad person without routine sweetness in my in my diet. Yeah. Pop tarts, frosted or unfrosted. I have not had a pop tart in 30 years and I don't intend to change that. <laughs> Last one for you. A, a tray of brownies just comes out of the oven. It's cooling for a little bit. Are you going to the corner edge, get a little bit of that crust, or are you going straight to the middle for the more ooey gooey section? I'm going to the corner. Nice. Are you, uh, are you also adding walnuts or any other type of nuts to the top of your brownies? Uh, you could do walnuts. You could do pecans. Um, uh, you know, again, nuts, nuts go in everything. You could even go with hazelnuts um, as long as, so Nutella is garbage that should be stricken from the earth. I despise <laughs> it in every way, but it's because it's all fake, right? It's just oil and sugar and, and pretend cocoa powder and, and essence of hazelnut that doesn't taste very good. Real hazelnuts are really, really good. Um, and chocolate hazelnut desserts are really, really good. Um, and so, yeah, yeah, you, you put hazelnuts in a brownie and, and uh, you're going to fight me for the pan. <laughs> uh, when you go a la mode, are you going straight up vanilla or is there a different flavor of ice cream you're putting on the uh, brownie? 
I would probably go straight vanilla. Yeah. Are you a fan of coffee? Oh yeah, of course. Yeah. I'm from Seattle. I was bottle fed coffee. <laughs> Again, another dumb question. So uh, I tell this to, to all of my guests who say they love coffee and they love brownies. Um, put the brownie in the bottom of a mug, top it with coffee ice cream, and then you'll have yourself a mocha as you're eating it. And then obviously the if you if you eat it slow enough, which I don't know I've ever actually have it happen, you know, the ice cream will melt into the brownie and then you really got yourself like a mocha going. I mean, on. brownie on the bottom. Yep. Ice cream on the top. Shot of espresso. There you go. The whole, thing's a, the whole thing's an affogato and it's just. Yep. Yeah. Eugene, thank you so much for joining us, man. This was a blast. Again, we're going to wish you all the positive vibes and good luck. We'll be tracking you starting on August 23rd at the Oregon 200. Thanks for joining us, man. Really appreciate your time. Thank you so much. This has been a blast. I, I, I'm stunned by how much we have in common. I, I you know, I, I, I'm, I'm, I'm sending you the emoji on threads of the, did we just become best friends? Yes. Um, so uh, thanks so much. Have a great time. What, what's your next race? So we are going to, we are looking at bountiful six hour uh, race, which is in Hemet, California. And I believe that's in October. And then also the 70.3 at Indian Wells uh, in December um, later, the, later on this year. Those are the two big events coming up. All right. And then my last thing that I'm going to bring up is uh, maybe think about, so the one thing that I really want to do in my life that I have not done in an athletic sense is um, I want to qualify for hard rock. Um, so I think I'm going to do the bear 100 next year. So, so look at, take a look at that and see if you, uh, if you maybe want to come out to Northern Utah, Southern Idaho and run a hundred miles. Let's do it, man. Like I, I like, you know, since I started the business, obviously it's really tough to get in like consistent yeah. training with the business and everything else. But after three and a half years, the company fee, I'm not saying we could put it on autopilot, but we definitely have opportunities to now go and do more things. And, and the idea is um, getting back to doing a hundred mile next year. So I've got my pen. I'm writing down bear 100 right now. Yeah. And we'll take a look at that. And it'll be a blast to race alongside you. That'd be awesome. Talk Thanks. to you soon, man. Have a good one. You bet. Thanks, everybody, for joining me. Coming up on Thursday, July 25th, beyond the finish line with Joe Harden at 3 p.m. His guest will be Christina Harriman. So make sure to join us for that show right here on Instagram, YouTube, Facebook, LinkedIn, and X. Uh, thank you for joining us. And make sure when you listen to this show on the Everyday Athlete Podcast Network, wherever you get your podcasts, you subscribe, rate, 